Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this part two of the group discussion on groin hernias. Uh, just a little recap. We stopped at this point last time in part one, where we define what is the current recommendation for different groups of people with groin hernias. If it is a unilateral in men, you could consider either open or laparoscopic repair. Unilateral in women, perhaps laparoscopic for cosmetic reasons. Bilateral in men and women, laparoscopic, it could be either tap or tap. There is nothing much to choose between the two. If it's a large scrotal hernia, perhaps you're better off with open surgery. These are the recommendations from various guidelines as well as various uh, other reports. Okay, there are some special situations. Mostly you're concerned about technical difficulty, adhesions, associated comorbidity, comorbidities and the like. So if somebody has had a previous pelvic or lower abdominal surgery, you would probably hesitate to do a laparoscopic approach. But having said that, if you have had enough experience, you could perhaps give it a try. If general anesthesia is not possible, generally open procedure, but there have been many, many papers, many, many people who have done laparoscopic surgery under epidural or spinal anesthesia. The information or recommendation on recurrence is a little more straightforward. If somebody has had a previous... The principle is that you go and repair in virgin territory uh, so that you have the best chance of uh, success. So if somebody has had an open operation initially, go for a laparoscopic procedure. If somebody has had a laparoscopic procedure previously, go for an open procedure. This is where it, it stands as of now. Any comments, Ravi? Correct, sir. I, I agree with you totally. No, no, this one. Srikant? Okay, maybe it's not. Agree, agree, sir. Totally okay. agree. Okay. So, if it is an open operation, the question arises, which is the preferred operation? Indraja. Hello, sir. Yeah. Uh, sir, uh, better is uh, uh, like three strings, sir. Can okay. All right. Is there an option? We can do business also, sir. Bessini? Uh, Bessini is not considered anymore. It has to be a tension-free repair. Please understand that. Yes. Lichtenstein's is one of them. Is there any other tension-free repair? Equivalent. Without using a mesh. Pavan? Desardas repairs. Desardas, yeah, not as, as popular as something else. Yeah, I wouldn't discount it, but yeah. Sanya, you have anything else that, that you can think of? Something so is that it is... Is mo modified Bessini, sir? No, no, no. Abdul, are you there? Sir, uh, plug and... Uh... Plug and other things. You know, I, I think I showed some data earlier that there is no advantage of plug over any other kind of mesh repair. Something which is tension-free, done under local anesthesia, originated in Toronto, Canada. Shoulders. Shoulders, all right? So if you have something else in mind, you would always compare shoulders versus Lichtenstein. Shoulders is a good method. You don't want to use a prosthesis, a mesh. You could use it, all right? But it is it is not, the technique is sort of exclusively shoulders. The kind of tremendously good reports, uh, results uh, that, that people have obtained have been in shoulders uh, clinic. It's not been sort of reproduced elsewhere. And so you find that Lichtenstein is perhaps better than shoulders for a unilateral inguinal hernia. Recurrences differed significantly between the groups with five in the shoulders group, 4% recurrence and 0.8% in Lichtenstein's group. And patients felt more pain in 
the shoulders group. So perhaps you would go for a Lichtenstein's uh, method with a mesh if you're doing an open repair. If laparoscopic, tap or tap. I thought I had done it last time, but you got the answer now. Okay, so uh, I thought I had already gone through this last time, but it, it's come here. So I will not ask you because I had given you the answer in the beginning of the uh, presentation. Large number, 17 and a half thousand patients. Okay, and you had about 61% doing tap. That is seems to be a more popular uh, choice and 38% with tap repair. Okay, complications, reoperation rates, no difference whatsoever. The post-operative complication rate occurred a little bit marginally in the TAP group. None of it needed any active intervention, but they found that in this cohort, TAP had many more patients with larger defect sizes and more scrotal hernias and older age. So these might be the reasons for a slightly higher complication. Ravi. Sir, the, I think your point, which the final point that you made is extremely important. I think, uh, you know, the there are lots of, uh, you know, we had this hernia, uh, this I think, uh, this one, John Tanakumar from Chennai, and uh, I think two or three other, uh, this one, in, in a hernia uh, symposium. So, one of the consensus was that in case, you, as you said, in a large inguinoscrotal hernias are large, uh, large inguinal hernias coming up to the root of the scrotum and things like that, you know, you would prefer to do it tap because of the fact that it, it is, it will lends itself easier because in the tap plane to pull the hernial sac, you know, may be very difficult, but in the, in the tap it is probably easier. And so, because of that, so in case after you have done a significant number, you then take on these difficult cases, you know, large inguinoscrotal hernias, scrot ing uh, hernias coming up to the root of the scrotum and things like that. You can then do a tap repair and hence the probably a slight complication like seroma, maybe hematoma and things may be a bit more with the tap repair, probably for that reason, I think. But also, I would like to remind all the youngsters, young surgeons and the postgraduates here that if you have large scrotal hernias, do not go for laparoscopic repair yeah. until you have 50, 60, 70 hernias under your belt because those can be tricky and it is much safer for the patient to go for open repair, open Lichtenstein's repair. Also, remember that 70, 75% of groin hernias are repaired by the open method in this world today. People at Sagar, trainees will get a slightly skewed uh, you know, idea because most of us, but all of us are doing only, practically only laparoscopic hernia repair and that's not the usual in the world. Not that we're doing something unusual or something that's not accepted. As I mentioned earlier, laparoscopy is getting more and more accepted. And in the years to come, it will it will form the majority of repairs. But as of now, open hernias are still the major are still in the majority. Okay, and some more information from the guidelines. Right? There's no evidence supporting tap ahead of tap or otherwise. Okay. Tap is beneficial, particularly if there is diagnostic uncertainty, and in cases of groin and lower abdominal pain. Since it can be used to grossly assess intra-abdominal structures. I would add to this, women, okay, it's not often that you get groin hernias in women, but if you have those, it's perhaps better to do TAP because it's always good in a symptomatic person to have a look at the uterus and the adnexa. If there is an obstructed hernia, should you do laparoscopy or open? Pavan. To open, sir. Why? Uh, sir, uh, if there is any collection of fluid, uh, if you plan for any mesh, further infection of mesh will be there, sir. All right. So, this collection of fluid is a, is a point for you of, uh, of uh, some potential danger. And, sir, the viability of the content, sir, if it is a bowel, uh, right. whether it Yangrinus or not. So what would prevent you from 
putting a laparoscope in and just watching in an obstructed hernia many times i'm sure you have seen it in your 33 years of surgical experience as a pg that the moment you give anesthesia the hernia gets reduced it just plop, pops in as soon as the patient is relaxed have you seen it or have you not seen it it's a seen sir you've seen it so in such a case what would why would you not even attempt a laparoscope mm -hmm. and even if it doesn't pop in how do you know that there is a questionable viability how do you know it is not just momentum if it is if it is bubble how do you know that that bubble has compromised blood supply so there are criteria for that right to know so is it or is it not wise do you think to have an open mind and make a blanket statement that all obstructed hernias must be dealt with with open method do you agree with that or not uh no, sir, we can try laparoscopy as and well. you know, you have changed your mind, so it can be tried. Sanya, what do you think? Sir, I think it is based on the surgeon, sir. Whichever uh, this whichever method they feel can be better operated. But laparoscopy. No, no, no. I'm I talking about a I'm talking about a surgeon who is equally well versed with both laparoscopy. Laparoscopic, and laparoscopic, laparoscopic no. sir. Okay. If you do a laparoscopy, what are the things you should be careful about? First is the entry of the trocar, sir, since it will be a distended and, bubble. All right, very port, good. Any port very port good. placement. Okay. And uh, then we'll have to uh, search for the defect and the where the obstruction lies. Okay. So maybe problem uh, arises there. Okay. Once uh, we find out which segment of the bubble is viable or not, okay. we can go ahead with the procedure. Sir. The even if the bubble is viable, is there some situation where you would like to avoid a mesh in the area? You know, there is a point in what. So the, yes, sir. Pavan then said there, about there infected fluid. Infected yeah. fluid collection. Yes, sir, definitely. Yeah. At that time, you would just, uh, we would not place a mesh. Does every fluid collection bother you, or is there something that no, points to a possible infected fluid? A brownish fluid, sir. Yeah, so very good. Brownish, brownish fluid. fluid. And, and one more thing on the bubble, some sign on the bubble which may say that there can be a degree of bacterial contamination. Features of peritonitis on the serosa. It may not be general okay. peritonitis, but yes, if you yes. have an exudate or lo loss of glistening peritoneum on the serosa, on the serosa of the bar, okay, yes, sir. then then there is a potential. So if that happens, you've done a laparoscopy, you find yes, that sir. there is some possible peritonitis on the on the obstructed part of the bowel that you have by now reduced and uh, examined, what would you do? Yes, sir. I, would I would definitely not place a mesh, but if it is a direct hernia, uh, which is very unlikely to get obstructed, I might uh, just do an anatomical repair by approximating the wall. From inside? From on the, well, you, have, you have a lapros laparoscopy, remember? You've done a laparoscopy. Yes, yes. You find that the yes. bowel is viable, but it has a degree of possible peritonitis, possible hemorrhagic infected fluid in the sac, what would you do? The anatomical repair has to be done, sir, but... Uh, yeah, so this is this is your algorithm, okay? Exploratory laparoscopy, reposition of corneal sac content. Now, if there is recovery of the bar or the omentum with no transmural peritonitis, okay? There is no evidence of peritonitis. Then do a tap for tap. Complete your laparoscopic repair. If there is possibility of infected fluid or transmural peritonitis, close the sac and come out and do a Lichtenstein's repair later. All you have achieved now is reduction. Some people may argue with this and say, look, I'll go ahead and do an anatomical repair from the outside. All right, you can do a shoulders or you can even do in a very rare instance um, a modified uh, bassini. But the ideal thing is to do not, I wouldn't do all that. I'm saying there are options that other surgeons might take. I would definitely go by this. If there is an infection, I'll just reduce the sac. I can even make the hole bigger, you know, from inside. If there is a tight neck, I can make the hole bigger, reduce the sac. If it's viable, of course, you have to uh, 
resect it, resectional if it is viable, then of course you can do there is you know you can do a bubble resection, do a mini laparotomy, and do an open Lichtenstein's if there is, or you can do close the herniated sac and do a Lichtenstein's repair later. The options here are: can you put a mesh in the same sitting as expected? Uh, in a, in a non-viable ball and an infected sac. I would recommend, even though this algorithm says two Lichtensteins open, I would not do it in the same instance. So you do a ball resection, take out the sac from inside. You can always do that from inside and go in and do a formal Lichtenstein repair a month or two later. Okay, this would be the... And what would you do if you did not have laparoscopy at all. If you always did an open operation, you would do the same thing. If there is no uh, evidence of transmural peritonitis, you would go ahead with a regular repair, open repair. And if there is transmural peritonitis, you would just reduce the sac, perhaps excise the sac if it is uh, an indirect sac, and either do an anatomical repair and hope for and accept a bigger recurrence, or go in and do a Lichtenstein's later. Okay, that would be your algorithm. Ravi. Yes, sir. But there, there are instances where you could, instead of doing a Lichtenstein repair, you can just do a, what is called as a darn repair, which used to be done before. Yes. And the darning is actually good because it is, you know, kind of a... Tension-free. Yeah, tension-free via media between a proper mesh repair and a, this one. Yeah. In fact, I, I'm, I'm well versed with shoulders. I could happily do a shoulders also. Okay, that's something I would do. Even if there is bowel resection involved uh, or infected fluid involved. A shoulders, a dawn or a modified Bessini. These are, the, you know, you can do a Bessini and do what's called a Tanner slide where you cut on the rectus sheath to reduce the tension. So the, you just go back to the older methods. But the point there is do not use a mesh if there is suspected infection. All right, Abdul, any comments? Sir, uh, it's a present day role of Desada technique. Yeah, is it... Des Desada is something, yeah, I do not, because I'm in not. The, yes, in the journals, we don't find much about it. Sir, but, yeah, uh... yeah, I mean, you know, you should be very proud and happy that it's an Indian technique, uh, which has found some popularity, but I don't think it has gained a global popularity and you don't find it mentioned in many of the guidelines and things like that. Uh, even though in the Indian conferences, in the Indian contest, quite correctly, there's a lot said about the Zada. Ravi, your comment on the Zada. Yeah, I th see, I, I, the problem is, it's just like shoulders, you know, whether others can as successfully do the Desarda technique as uh, Mr. Desarda himself, Professor Desarda himself is a point. Uh, which I don't know whether many people have been able to reproduce the results that he has done. Yeah. And I think maybe he has to have a large series and try and publish it in one of the bigger journals. Maybe then he will gain the recognition. But that, but that is an option. So, the yeah. point is, don't put a mesh and you can use whatever else you're comfortable with. And you're also within your rights not to do any repair. But just deal with the emergency and tell them I'll come back in come back, yeah. four to four to eight weeks and do the proper repair. And then in which point the infection will have settled and you can do a classical Lichtenstein. Okay. Which sir, anesthesia you're gone. Sir, sir we, plug when in the uh, fact uh, like uh, like you have said in your guideline that you can use it. Yeah. Plug and uh, mesh repair is always I always do it for large sacs, a large, okay. large defects. Okay. Even though the the literature says that there's not much difference in recurrence rates between plug and uh, an ordinary flat mesh. Okay. So, but I'm, I'm somehow, you know, it's a, you can call it empirical, but if there's a very large defect, I always find uh, some comfort in putting a plug so that I have put a lot more mesh material there for the fibrosis to occur. That's my logic. Okay. All right. I think, and I think that is the other thing is, for example, the uh, most of the you know, the mesh repair and others, the way they have gone is to try and minimize the number of sutures to avoid chronic pain. 
So if you put a, a, a plug, then there is not much need for a uh, you know, lot of sutures. Yeah. On the other hand, if you have to close a, a large transversalis fascia, you know, you have to use transversalis fascia to close a large defect and that you know that you there is a potential for you to you know entrap the nerve which may cause chronic pain and of course uh, a weakness of the posterior wall posterior nishant wall. you have your hand up uh, sir just to clarify the comment on plug repair if i'm if uh, correct me if i'm wrong sir uh, plug repair with respect to inguinal hernia what we are talking about is putting a plug and an overlying mesh on top of it correct not only plug Correct. So, Abdul, so we are using two meshes, not a single mesh. And when we talk about plug mesh for a ventral hernia repair, it's normally in a scenario where we can't get the planes to put a mesh. You, like because of dense adhesions or something, there, if you find the hole, just plug a mesh into it and just stitch the edges and come out. There, you don't need to have two meshes. Yeah. yeah. It's different in a ventral hernia because once you have plugged the hole, if you put another mesh on top of it, it becomes an onlay. And onlay is not with. Okay. So that is the, yeah. But it's different in an England line. So which anesthesia would you prefer for open repair? Ravid, I don't think I've asked you anything today. Sir, uh, general anesthesia, sir. General anesthesia. Okay. Being a first year, I'd like to ask you some more simple questions. Go back one step and what are the kinds of anesthesia available for open repair? Sir, uh, general anesthesia and spinal anesthesia, sir. Anything else? Sir. Um, we can get uh, regional block anesthesia, sir. What is regional? Um... Uh, is spinal anesthesia regional sir, uh, or what? Uh, it, uh, it's a type of uh, regional block anesthesia, okay. sir. Are you, can you see the yes, chat sir. box? Can you see the chat box? Yes, sir. So yes, what sir. is the comment there from Nikita? Uh, local and regional, sir. Yeah, local anesthesia. Okay, that okay, is an option. Yes, That's an option. So, among these, which one would you prefer? Or where do you think the patient will have a smoother post-op period if you ensure an equi-analgesic effect in all three anesthesias? In other words, what are the problems that you would face with spinal, problems that you would face with general, which you may or may not face with local? Sir, uh, in spinal, there may be chances of urinary retention, sir. Very good. Very good. Yes. Uh, um, Tonic back pain? In general. Okay. Yes, sir. All right. And uh, headaches. General. Mm -hmm. Headache. Yes, spinal headaches. General. Yes, sir. Um, Can I have urinary there retention be... there also? Yes, sir. Yes, in sir. the wake up, there may be a severe breakthrough pain. Yes, breakthrough pain, and yes, when sir. You give them analgesics and things like that or anesthetic itself. There is another big thing that is an issue with general anesthesia. PONB. Yes, sir. What is it? PONB. Uh, uh, Nikita. No idea, sir, actually. No idea. Post-operative nausea and vomiting. Nausea and vomiting, sir. Hmm. You say it after I say it, Praveen yes. Ji. Ah, yes. you say it before I say it. Okay. Yes, so, oh, that's a big issue. So, yes, sir. the answer to that is this. Okay. When you have an open operation, Dr. Rajan is not here. He is a very big proponent of local anesthesia. Okay. People just walk out of the operating table after you have done uh, a repair. I also, in, in the elderly, comorbidity patients and, you know, who are scared of uh, GA, for example. If I do open, I do a lot of local anesthesia. And it's always preferable. Just remember, this is a systematic review and a meta-analysis. Ten original RCTs. They're all RCTs, meta-analysis of RCTs. So, local anesthesia is a good option. 
All right, it has actually greater satisfaction because in spinal, they may have all the things that we listed above. Local anesthetic versus general anesthetic reduces nausea, accelerates return to normal activities. Benefit of LA is sufficiently small that its use should be dictated by patient and clinical preference. The stark difference between LA and spinal anesthesia is not seen to that extent in this study at least between LA and general anesthesia, right? So it is the patient's preference. Ravi? Yes, sir. I think I, I agree that the local anesthetic in patients who are uh, high risk for general anesthesia and patients who prefer to do it, elderly especially, uh, I think it, it is excellent and the quality of anesthesia is so good that you are you know able to do the operation well and uh, the recovery is also very smooth. So I think I you know it's a good idea. Yeah. But uh, if uh, general anesthesia is possible, then maybe general anesthesia should, should you know equally good as uh, as local. Local, I think for only elderly it's better. But I have not usually doing the GR spinal. All right. What about laparoscopic? Yeah, please. Sir, uh, in uh, local anesthesia, muscle relaxation won't be uh, uh, relaxation won't be much. So you don't uh, you don't need much muscle relaxation. All right. Okay. In fact, if they cough and all that, and if they squirm, it makes it a little difficult. One of the yes, tricks sir, I sir. must mention here is to give not only a neural block of the ileoinguinal nerve and the ileohypogastric, but also give a field block. The whole area. Yeah has to be blocked. Volume is more important than strength. So what I do is use 20 ml of 2% and put 30 ml of saline in it. So I have a 50 ml of local anesthetic. And I give it in layers. You now I give a field block. I anesthetize the inguinal canal from the skin after the incision and after I actually uh, enter the inguinal canal, I give some more anesthetic there. So I use a large volume and wait a good three to four minutes. That's an important thing. We don't, you know, we don't wait long enough. You have to wait for the anesthetic to work. When you do this, it can be done with very good comfort to the surgeon and the patient. We have done it many times and I would I have, I have no hesitation in doing it. But laparoscopic repair is another ball game. Okay. So what are your views, Sanya? So for laparoscopic, definitely you prefer general anesthesia. Sir. General anesthesia. Have you ever seen or done any laparoscopy under spinal? Uh, no, sir. I'm or not. read papers about it? Uh, no, sir. I'm not. Yeah. I'll read all of You're quite right that general anesthesia is preferred. Okay. And enthusiasts have done a lot of step under LA and SGA, spinal anesthesia also, okay? But the important thing is that because of the steep positions that you give for the patient, they are uncomfortable if they are away, all right? And the shoulder pain can be experienced if you do not have a high enough anesthesia, okay? You cannot have so much, and so if you have sudden insufflation, patients can experience shoulder pain. But in this study from 2017, all right, spinal anesthesia was better than GA. It had better post-op pain relief, mobilization, patient satisfaction. 80 patients, not a very large number, not a great, not a great journal as well, but it is indexed. Please remember it's indexed. I took it from PubMed. Uh, but that is one of the things which is a minority view as far as anesthesia in, uh, in laparoscopic repair is concerned. Which mesh would you use? Abdul? Uh, polypropylene. I know. What else would you use? Are there any types of polypropylene yeah. that you use? What are they? And what so are their characteristics? Rate. Okay, sorry? Lightweight and then heavy. Yes, light heavy mesh weight. and a heavy mesh. What is the difference between the two? Um, 
knitting sir like closely multiple the pore size yes sir. pore yes. size and the amount of the polypropylene material in it okay the light white one has larger pores less polypropylene heavy ones have um, you know smaller pores and more polypropylene there is also the combination of polypropylene with uh, polyglactin you know wipro as it is called wipro or wipro what is the difference between the two and what is the theoretical uh, advantage of one over the other if there is any so there is no uh, advantage of uh, wipro mesh over uh, polypropylene all right what about lightweight and heavy heavy mesh light and heavy mesh so heavy mesh uh, i think there is more fibrosis or ingrowing of the mesh into the surrounding structure are you sure whatever has the bigger pore will have more fibrosis okay okay so in fact the light lightweight mesh will have more fibrosis and it is also more pliable it also is very uh, you know very easily placed and positioned whereas the heavy mesh is a little stiffer what do we use normally so you use lightweight huh? no it's not what we know the polypropylene mesh that we normally use at least i normally use and i presume most of you use the same thing ravi correct me i think it's a heavy mesh it's, it's heavy a mesh. dolphin sir johnson johnson which is heavy mesh they, they all of them have both light and heavy all manufacturers okay so what we use is stiffer polypropylene it's a heavy mesh okay so uh you can see the uh, issue that you know the information that nishant has put into it okay but the point is that which one would you use in these are the theoretical considerations but what do the studies say about what you should use in hernia repair any idea abdul the polypropylene sir i know but heavy or light is my question sir um, no, that not sure yeah have you seen the guidelines please mm. see the guidelines of course this is 2013 it has been repeated you know ehs guidelines of 2020 as well okay no consensus regarding light versus heavy mesh all of you must read the guidelines it's freely available if you don't get hold of it let me know i'll send it to you but it's important that all of you groin hernia is such a common operation that you must read about it okay flat mesh which essentially means that there is no clinical advantage of plugs as they say and cost effective lightweight mesh should be used this is 2013 okay but in 2020 ehs guidelines european hernia society guidelines there is no consensus regarding light versus heavy mesh okay that is what is the answer how would you fix the mesh we either stitch it or put tackers right are there any other methods of fixing it nikita Uh, what are the other options for dealing with the mesh after you put it in uh, not sure more than not those sure. okay praveen your hand is up sir uh, actually i had doubt in the previous one sir okay go on, ask i uh, said uh, large pore causes more fibrosis no, sir yes So, uh, but in the belly, it is given opposite to it, sir. Uh, large pore causes less fibrosis and pain, sir. I'll have to look at the papers again. If you're, you know, I might have got it wrong, but I don't think so. But let me check it again. Uh, uh, yes, sir. You know, I mean, you can, you know, we'll check it and get back, back, get back on that. Okay. But my understanding yes, is that if you have a larger pore, there is more space and more fibrosis. If you have a small yes, pore. Larger small... pores will uh, provide a uh, more space for the lymphocytes to infiltrate there, sir, and it will provide more fibrosis. Correct. That's what I said. If Bailey Love says something else, I'll have to look at it and uh, you know check on that. Okay, but he he will not be correct then because if more people, if I produce more data for you or more papers which say that large bore produces more fibrosis, it is also logical to my mind. We look at it. We look at it. We must have an open mind about all this, and it's good that you question our statements. I welcome it. 
okay and so heavy messages also provide contractors i read it sir i don't yeah, yeah 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 that's true contractor is a part of all meshes it can be more in heavy meshes if you yeah we were looking at apart from putting tackers and sutures what are the other options for dealing with the mesh pavan indraja sir i am not sure sir I'm not sure sanya sir i read about a glue that fixes the mesh yes there is a glue and is there a need to fix the mesh always particularly in no, tech you need no, not even fix always. it yeah okay there are any number of surgeons who when they do tap in tap you have to because it's we have opened up the whole area but in tap okay nishan says bailey has not mentioned what praveen said we have to listen to nishan because he is reading bailey love like mad nowadays i know for a particular reason so perhaps it doesn't say that. yeah okay anyway yeah, sorry why is he reading why is he doing it oh he's he's teaching people he's teaching uh -huh. people yeah so uh, anyway yeah coming back to this your options for mesh fixations are a no fixation at all in tap use of sutures use of tackers and use of glue okay cyanoacrylate glue fibrin glue any of them can be used which one do you think would be useful what are the considerations for what are the things that you will look for about the fixing mechanism sanya theory tell me this is the way one should think and think and choose what are the things that you are concerned about when you fix a mesh so first is when you are taking the first bite uh, near the pubic tubercle you be careful yes. not to take a thick bite to prevent right. osteitis very good like it should not be under tension sir when you taking okay. the uh, when you fixing to the inguinal ligament it should not be under tension okay that is you have to be careful about the major vessels that come um, around in and around the uh, inguinal canal yes for the, uh, one of the the thing could be uh, we can see uh, to prevent as much as crumpling as possible sir okay so okay. the first thing is that that it should be effective in keeping the mesh in place yes sir and also that to cover thing. the defect Yes, yeah, and also the, be covering all yeah, the defects. That's what it means. You mm -hmm. Cover all the defects, mm -hmm. keep the mesh in place, and yeah. pain. Okay, not only osteitis mm -hmm. pubis, which is a consideration, much more common yeah. than that. Just pain. You want to die now? You want to die now? Okay. Over. Yeah. So you may include things, the nerves in the in your in your stitch and things like that. Okay. So this is a randomized study comparing fibrin glue versus suture for mesh fixation. All right, you can see. that the pain was significantly higher in the suture group in the immediate post op phase and the mean total dose of analgesia of a pain killer was less in the fibrin glue more in the suture group in other words the effectivity is the same as far as fixation of the mesh is concerned but glue fixation is less painful but as far as i see none of us use it any reason why Power Sorry. availability. Availability everybody has, but Abdul got the answer. I think it was Abdul. Cost, okay. It's very expensive, and so you would not really want to use it. Would you prophylactically explore or fix the contralateral side? This is a very interesting thing. In fact, we had an experience even today. So Nikita will not be allowed to answer this because we had a little chat about it. Um, would you? prophylactically explore the contralateral side somebody comes to you with a unilateral hernia what are the chances that they have perhaps an occult hernia on the opposite side so praveen has put it up there okay probably is right so we have to accept that but this is not necessarily correct probably but we look at other papers also all right okay yes sir yes all right okay go on okay who's taking this abdul 
sir uh, it's, it's not required sir to prophylactically why not but there are indications of uh, like uh, bilateral inguinal hernia uh, the other side happening or i think it is yeah, 30% i'm not sure 30% 30% huh no i'm not sure sir exactly. not sure all right but okay, to look, look at this data and fix it is i yeah. think uh, yeah not required See, a lot of people had a negative contralateral expiration. So please, remember, please look at the thing in the red. When considering prophylactic repair during TEP, the yearly risk of only 1.2% of a contralateral hernia after negative exploration needs to be balanced against the low but potential risk of inguinodynia. Okay? So it's 1.2% per year is all that you will have if you have no hernia on the other side. The situation is a little different when A, you actually see an ultrasonically described hernia on the other side or B, as it happened to us today, even if the ultrasound doesn't say, when you find a very lax, easily collapsible area, which is a potential weakness. You can't call it a hernia. There is no lump, but there's a potential weakness that can be appreciated. So when that is seen, perhaps you're justified. For us, it is not, we don't have to explore a lot because we do taps. But this becomes an important point when you do a tap because you don't actually go into the opposite joint. You do only unilateral ones, okay? So that is an important point, particularly in tap. The, the message here is that you don't have to do it. If you have no clinical or sonological evidence of hernia on the opposite side. Ravi? Yes, sir. I, I think I agree. The, um, again, I think it depends on the when you look at the other side, whether it's on, on laparoscopy, you see the other side that there is a hernia or um, if the ultrasound say, says that there is a hernia, then you have to counsel the patient uh, about whether they want it done, even though there are no symptoms on the other side. If the patient so wishes, then you may you are well within your rights to repair the other side. If the patient is uh, equivocal about it, then I think you'll have to take a call depending on the size of the hernia, whether you would want to repair the other side or leave it alone if it is just a dimple or something like that. So the other important thing is a cord lipoma. You must have seen, if you have seen enough, like, enough hernias, you will see a lump of fat sitting in the cord. What do you do about it is the question. Sanya. Yes, sir, I would always excise if there is a yes, cord like over because that itself can present as a swelling and the patient can think that her, 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 the problem is not solved. Okay, okay. Will it come as a swelling, swelling or something else happens? The cord like over. Can present as a swelling. Yeah, but that is within the inguinal canal, right? But you're doing a yes, suppose please. you're doing a laparoscopic surgery. So you find a little fat fatty lump sitting at the inguinal ring. What would you do with it? I it is separate from the sac, remember. I would still prefer to remove it. Sir. You would prefer to remove it. Abdul, any other views? So um I won't remove it. Sir. You wouldn't remove it. Why if would you I not know it is it? separate from the sac. You would not. Why would you not do that? So because uh, we don't know the if you try removing and the vascularity of the cord can be okay. You think that dissection would compromise? That's yeah. a logical thinking process. Yeah. Sanya is right in removing, but the cause she gave was wrong. Okay, cord lipoma accounts for recurrence. Okay. What, what it does is it actually occupies space. And even if you have removed the sac, it still leaves you with a lax, a lax potentially protrudable, protrusible uh, structure, which is the lipoma. Okay. So you have to always remove it. And either you reduce it pull it back behind the mesh, which means into the abdominal cavity. 
the mesh is distal to it against the abdominal wall, or you can, I always resect it. I'm not too worried about the vascularity. So the message is clear. All cord lipomas have to be excised. Otherwise, they lead to a, a higher recurrence rate. Okay. Srikant? Uh, I always exercise. I have the bad experience of one recurrence. All right. Ravi? Yes, sir. I agree. You have yeah. to exercise. Okay. Are there any absolute contraindications for laparoscopic surgery? Sir, the other thing is, if it is yeah. a large direct hernia, mm. uh, then, you know, it is more imperative to actually exercise the cord lipoma because it may be hiding a small indirect sac if, if at all. Yeah. So, it is definitely absolutely. Fair enough. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Any absolute contraindications for laparoscopic surgery? Nikita. Yes, sir. Uh, Koglopathy. Hmm. Absolute. Relative. Relative, sir. Relative contraindication. Okay. Uh, previous abdominal surgeries which pro produce like Large addition, sir. Uh, All right. Relative or absolute? This also could be relative, sir. Yeah. Okay. In a hernia, obviously strangulating ischemic bowel is perhaps the only contraindication for laparoscopy. All others are relative. Comorbidities, intolerance, pneumoperitoneum, adhesions, CLD, and things like that. But if somebody has come with, you know, classical clinical description, long, a long uh, history of pain and obstruction, vomiting, abdominal distension, tense, tender, irreducible hernia, where you see, obviously, that it is, you can even be discolored skin sometimes, where it is obviously strangulating, not just <laughs> obstructing. In that situation, you probably would not want to put a laparoscope in do an open operation straight away and bowel resection. And uh, we, we discussed what else you do with the honey earlier. So that is about the only absolute contraindication. Okay, all others are related. Okay, how do you deal with post-operative chronic inguinal or scrotal pain? This is one of the common things uh, after hernia repair. What is the definition of chronic pain? Praveen, definition of chronic pain. Sir, uh, three months of uh, intermittent and constant taste. Color three pain, months, sir. three months, three months of pain. Okay, that's fine. So how do you deal with it? What are your options? Uh, sir. Nikita, I don't mind is up. Sir. Sir, actually, uh, the recently the recently mm -hmm. published article it says that six three months. months it, uh, yes, sir. Yeah. Three there months are... could be still inflammatory reaction. Uh, yeah. So six months is considered as chronic pain as of yeah. now. There is a there is a dichotomy, but most people consider three months. I okay. agree with you. I've seen some papers which say six months, but most people consider it as three months. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, what are the options in treating this? Indraja. Uh, sir, uh, we'll give analgesic, sir. Like Sorry? Sir. Analgesic, sir. Like painkillers. Okay. And what painkillers? What, what painkiller would you do? Uh, any sites or paracetamol. Okay. Any other kinds of painkillers? Uh, opioids. Opioids? Opioids is severe. Uh, not. This is... Yeah, I wouldn't use those. Yeah. Yes, sir. Or, uh, it is said neural pain, right? So would you do something else? Uh, like pregabalin or... Uh, ah, pregabalin. Gabapain. Okay. Yes, sir. Gabapentin, yeah. Okay. Yes. Anything else you can do? Third years must be able to answer this. Okay, before I put up the answer, uh, to answer Abdul's question, can you put a mesh in a patient with ascites and CLD? Yes, you can. 
you will end up, you know, you must excise the sac completely. Otherwise, you'll end up still with a groin, uh, with a groin swelling. But you can put a mesh, perhaps give them not just prophylactic antibiotic, but treatment antibiotics for five days because they're immunocompromised and vigorously control the ascites. All right. We, we discussed, we had a big discussion about this uh, in umbilical hernia, whether to treat it or not and all that. There was a symposium on this. And I spoke about it. So similar rules apply to inguinal hernia also. So you can put a mesh, but you must control the ascites. Nikita, your hand is up. Yes, sir. Regarding uh, chronic pain, sir. Yeah. Uh, so first, initially, we have to do a proper clinical examination uh, to rule out whether uh, it's recurrence or uh, due to mesh infection, sir. Good. And uh, you need by... not even have infection. You know, is it a recurrence? Is it an infection? Or is it nothing but inguinodynia? So when yes. I pose this question, I presume there is no complication other than pain. Okay. No recurrence, no infection. But anyway, you're right in that you have to check that. Yeah, okay. Then we Sanya, go okay, go on, go on. You, you have, you have something more to say. Go on. Nothing, sir. Uh, then we go for pain management and okay. later on the surgical management, sir. Is that all? What management? The surgical management, like re-exploration okay. or uh, removing uh -huh. the tackers. Uh -huh. Releasing the uh, sutures if required. Okay. And the last resort would be neurectomy, sir. Uh, Very good. Wow. You quickly looked up now or you knew before? Before, sir. I have good, seen good, good, good. You've been reading it. Very good. Yes. All right. So the, the risk factors are young age, female sex, recurrent hernia repair, open repair. One of the biggest things consistently proved is Inguinodynia is less in lepros laparoscopic repair. Okay, and independent, uh, there are independent factors. Chronic post operative pain, CPIP, is independent of technique and identification and protection of inguinal nerves. Reduction for lightweight mesh compared with heavyweight mesh. Pharmacological pressure measures, gabapantin and carbamazepine. These are anti epileptic drugs, for example. And triple neurectomy. You can explore and see if any nerve is caught or something that can be dealt with. But the safest thing is to do, cut off all the nerves that are there. Ileoinguinal, ileohypogastric. And I'm not quite sure what the third nerve is. It, it may even be lateral cutaneous nerve of the thigh. That's what I'm guessing. Ravi, you have any anything to offer in this? Yeah. Sir, the other thing you could potentially use is you use the anesthetics. Yeah. And many times there will be Lock. a trigger point from where the pain is. Yeah. You can initially give a local anesthetic. Uh, and and see if it works. Away, if the pain goes away, then you can use steroids, tramsin yeah. alone and things yes. like that. that can which will help. Yeah. And if that is not, then, then you go for neurectomy. The third nerve would be genitofemoral nerve. I think. So genitofemoral branch. Okay. All right. All right. That's fine. And how would you deal with recurrent hernia? You already answered that question. Yes. <laughs> okay. It's very simple. If it's open, go for laparoscopy. If it's laparoscopy, go for open repair. Okay. Okay. It's the same thing with the guidelines also mentioned the same thing. How to deal with large hernial sacs? Sanya. Usually excise the factor. Okay. Something uh, more, whether direct, indirect, you have to. Yeah. In a direct open method, reduce. Excision can be a question because if it is sliding hernia, a large part of that lateral wall of that sac could be bowel. So, so when you excise, in a direct hernia, be very careful. Just open it and make sure that it is not bubble forming a part of the wall. Only then you excise. If it's a bubble, close up the hole you made in the sack and reduce it. Okay. Indirect, open, excise. Direct, laparoscopic, reduce and leave the distal sack. You can cut it off at the neck. There's nothing wrong in that. You can cut it off at the neck. Leave the distal sac and 
indirect laparoscopic also if it's a large sac you can leave the distal sac and just cut it off at the neck and close it with a mesh one of the problems in these large sacs is seroma formation so you can you can warn the patient about a seroma is there something you can do to reduce the seroma Anything you can do to reduce the potential dead space in the distal sac that you have left. Okay. The same fibrin glue that you use to stick the mesh to the abdominal wall can be used to stick the anterior sac wall to the posterior sac wall. It potentially reduces the dead space. It has been shown that it reduces the fluid collection that occurs in the distal sac. I have never used it, but this is one option. What I do is warn them about a possible seroma. Most of the time that, that goes off by itself. If it doesn't go off, even after one or two months, I aspirate it once or twice at three to four weekly intervals. And almost certainly by then it's, it, it stops. But there's one small number, very small number. I've done it about perhaps three or four times in my whole career, when this sac becomes organized, the seroma, particularly if it's a hematoma, can become organized, thick wall, and it will keep on absorbing fluid and it never settles down. In which case, you go, go, in, go in in an open method and excise the sac. In these patients, you should also warn them, particularly if they're elderly, that we may have to do an orchidectomy along with the excision of the distal sac. Okay, that's what is required. Ravi, comments? Yes, sir. I agree. Yeah, I think the it is rarely a problem. The large, you know, the distal sac. Uh, if uh, repeated aspirations, the you know, if it doesn't settle, then you go back and excise the sac. Otherwise, yeah. most of it settles. Yeah. Right, sir, uh, role of drain, sir. Uh, yeah. Role of drain in uh, in case of seromas to, to prevent seromas, sir. Yeah, you can use it. Many people do, but it doesn't work very well. Right. That's why I usually don't put a drain in the distal sacs at all. Perhaps I'm guessing here the reason for the drain not working is that you can't leave it long enough. Okay, large sac, it is still a secretory, secreting surface. And unless you collapse the wall completely, which the drain may not achieve, the, the, the secretions continue. And you can't leave the drain in for ages. You know, you may leave it in for three, four days or five days. So that is probably why you get a recurrence. Okay, um, Nishant has put something in the... In the uh, Chat box. Let me read it. Mesh with thinner strands and larger pores. Between them have better tissue integration, less contracture, less foreign body reaction, more flexibility and improved comfort. What you have posted is only the summary and there seems to be a mistake in that. Yeah, that's what he's saying. Yeah, that, I agree with that. Okay. All right. Drain placement. You have mentioned that. Yeah. Can you use drains close to the mesh? Yes. If it's a closed drain system, proper nursing with, uh, you know, washed hands and the like, then you can put a drain. But as I said, it's not with the fear of infection, but the possibility of, uh, you know, ineffectivity that we do not use a mesh. One of the other things is what do you do with an infected mesh? I just want one simple answer from Indraja. Should you always remove it or can you look at conservative methods? Sir, we can uh, do conservative. We can what? try with antibiotics. Sir. All right. Uh, mm -hmm. What are the riders for that? If you have an abscess sitting there on ultrasound, infected mesh, would, would you do use antibiotics? We can drain the abscess, sir. Yeah. Followed by the antibiotics. All right. Leave the wound open. Irrigate the wound and the mesh fixity must be there. Sometimes you find infected meshes lying freely and floating freely in an abscess cavity, in which case you have to remove it. Otherwise, if the mesh is fixed in position, there's a little collection above it, 
or deep to it. You can drain it. Leave the wound open. Don't close the wound. Regular irrigation and antibiotics. How long would you give the antibiotics for? So three to four weeks. Sir. Correct. And what is the kind of salvage rate that you can expect? 50 to 60. 60%. Correct. 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 You can salvage about 60 to 70 percent of these meshes. So every single infected mesh need not be removed. When you have an open wound, you can either dress it with the conventional method or even use a negative pressure wound therapy. Okay. So among 13 patients in this particular study, only one patient needed to have his mesh removed. Okay. So the riders are. Uh, which is the preferred antibiotic in such cases? Culture sensitivity would be dictating the term. Most of them it comes as steroids, sir. Uh, my my my, my yeah my first line antibiotic is uh, uh, pipe, not piperacillin uh, amoxicillin clavulanic acid augmented amoxicillin clavulanic acid that's my first. Need, if, need, yeah, if you have staff, you can use linazolid for linazolid. three weeks. Three to four weeks is a minimum. You can also use the the uh, uh, dalasin, which is. Uh, uh, what is that now? Anti staphylococcal, uh, anti anaerobic. Yeah. Yeah. I'm okay. Saying... Yeah. So, as I said, the message from these two papers that I have quoted all right, that resolution of symptoms in three weeks after of surgical intervention, deep seated mesh infections, they were explanted laparoscopically. This, the reason I put up this paper was that if there's a deep infection, First, deep to the mesh, you can consider laparoscopic surgery as well. I have somehow not, not, not favored this, even though it has been done. I you know, Thankfully, I don't have a huge experience of infected meshes. But in the four or five that I have dealt with, explantation has been very uh, rare. Uh, and it is usually done by the open method. The important thing, leave the wound open. Use either conventional dressings or negative pressure dressings. Explantation needs experience. So if you are a beginner, do not try it yourself because you can have bubbles stuck to the deeper aspect of the mesh and you really need an experienced surgeon to go in and do it. Okay? So this is another paper. Treatment of mesh infection should be individualized. That is the message from here. There is no single rule to say this, but some of the points that we made are the ones which will ensure success. Okay? I think I'm on to my last question, I think, maybe one or two. If you have gallstones and hernia, would you do it together? Which one would you do first? Why are we even asking this question, uh, Nikita? It's most commonly encountered, sir. Yeah. So, so why are we asking this question? What is the concern? Uh, one is a sterile zone and the other one... Uh... Very good. It's a clean, contaminated zone. So, you are worried about possibly getting your mesh infected. Yes, sir. So, would you do it or would you not do it? We, we would do it together, sir, but uh, we would do hernia first. Then why, the... why is that? Uh, to prevent instrument contamination and also change instruments, it, change instruments. The field, the area gets in the, like uh, hmm. mesh gets exposed Some, to the yes. sorry, your contamination chances are the same either way because you're closing your you know, if you do a tap, you're not even opening the peritoneum. If you are doing a tap, you are closing the peritoneum. Make sure that you get a good closure. So the chances of contamination are nearly the same. What else would be driving your common sense? You don't even have to go for RCTs for this. What would be driving your thought process? If you have a bilateral hernia, which side would you repair first? I didn't get it, sir. You have both right and left-sided inguinal hernia. Which side would you start repairing first? 
the and side with the uh, higher uh, like i mean the larger defect larger defect suppose the patient had obstruction or pain on the left side with a smaller defect and an asymptomatic larger defect on the other side which one would you repair the symptomatic side sir why if any uh, difficulty occurs in the surgery and if you abandon it he shouldn't complain that the symptomatic is one is left out the non symptomatic one is operated first excellent okay why would you not extend that logic to gallbladder and hernia yes sir yes. that's all there is to it so if the patient had symptomatic gallstones also has incidental hernia do the gallbladder first if the patient had symptomatic hernia and had incidental gallstones do the gallstones last do the hernia symptomatic hernia first okay that is all there is to it ravi yes sir so is there any literature to suggest that you know uh, combined procedures are no longer preferred is there any literature to suggest nothing at that? all whatever i have seen say that it can be done safely but there is no literature to say which one should be done first but yeah. i have said you know use common sense yeah i think i agree with the common sense approach yeah, yeah. yeah. sorry if there just is make sure you use different instruments for gallbladder and hernia that's that's that is agreed nishant has put that in so you can use you know you, you can do both together but don't use the same uh you know instrument that you use for a gallbladder on a hernia that's all yeah morbidity no different from individual procedures so that is the important thing they perform successfully and it is not only gallbladder several things gynecological procedures like hysterectomy self injectomy everything has been done and done safely so what right. what is your what is your uh, uh, um uh, uh, what your opinion about an umbilical hernia with the uh, gallbladder i would prefer to do a, a laparoscopic cholecystectomy and anatomic repair and warn the patient that in case there is future recurrence then we would do the mesh repair so is that what you do or is no, you do no we do we do the routine you know, we, we treat the umbilical hernia on its merits so if it's a very small defect like 1 or 2 uh, cm i yeah. would do an anatomic repair which so i would do for most of the time that is the case and if it's a larger the... defect then, then i would still put a mesh even mesh, even for yeah. an umbilical hernia yeah, yeah okay so that's it about groin hernias guys uh, sir uh, but in that case sir when uh, you said uh, lap coli with a bigger hernia hmm. which will you do first sir same rules if, if it is the gallbladder that i started off with i would do the you know, the patient was symptomatic i would do that first if it's umbilical hernia i would do the dissection and everything else because i have to i have to go through the umbilicus for my gallbladder i would do everything first all the dissection and whatever else i have to do the gallbladder and then put the mesh to cover the umbilical defect because after i have even if it's a symptomatic umbilical hernia for example because after i have put a mesh and close the umbilicus i wouldn't make a hole through that to put my telescope you got that yes sir yeah yeah so that's what i did thank you yeah. all right any questions comments shrikant lightweight meshes produce more fibrosis is advantages or disadvantages advantage it has it is an advantage theoretically because you know they have larger pores and produces more uh fibrosis but the paper suggests that there is nothing to choose between the two this is a theoretical advantage but you can use either of them and the overall outcome is the same even the guidelines suggest that you know the latest ehs guidelines suggest that there is no consensus on which you which one you use yeah is there any initial for example is there a initial uh, less pain and less discomfort and less fearing of foreign body with a lightweight mesh compared to an uh, there is lightweight. in there is in some papers but not in all papers so there is no consensus just like uh, you know you do a, a pouch for no no rectal anastomosis the, the advantage accrued is only for the first one to two years after yeah. that there is no advantage yeah, yeah. okay all right final comments by ravi and then we close i think uh, it was very um, enlightening and very 
um, learning experience of dealing with various situations that are you know, the standard ones. Most of us are quite comfortable. The more difficult ones and more rarer uh, for problems, it is better to have a consensus view and an uh, evidence-based view so that you are able to justify what you have done. And I think you have given good evidence for most of the uh, problematic and sometimes difficult uh, situations that we handle. Thank you very much, sir. Sonia? A very good discussion, sir. Learned a lot from all the, the things which I thought to be correct were actually not. So very good discussion. Sir. All right. Thank you very much. Good night. I'll close the meeting. Sir. Yeah. You know, you Chandra phone money there. Our other Chandra bit put in Nala Belagi into a into Mukalo Tik Bartarante. So now you should go. We'll be there at that time. Yeah, we'll, uh, he said. He said, "Call me when you are leaving, and that's so we'll why." Uh, is he leaving? Is he? Let me just hold on. Just one second.